Hello. Hi, this is Dr. Abu Saif from Henry Ford Hospital. Hi, Ms. Williams. I am uh, I'm calling you just to uh, inform you that I was contacted by the Sinai Greece doctors regarding Ms. Williams, Mr. Williams being admitted. Uh, so I'm, I'm following with them, with the pulmonary doctors, the infection doctor, and I think they also will uh, involve the rheumatologist in there, depending on uh, on his uh, progression. And just wanted to uh, to see how you guys are doing through this rough time. 
Hi, Ka. Good afternoon. Daniel, are you signed in yet? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, Daniel, I, I can share the screen and whenever you tell me, we'll be good to go. Perfect, yeah, so I gave you host privileges if you wanna be able to share your screen, we can start in just two minutes. Okay, good, I will, uh, 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 I'll get that uh, uh, PowerPoint up and running uh, and then in two minutes, uh, we will start this, okay? Perfect, thank you. Thank you, my friend. You're able to see my screen, correct? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. So I'll wait another minute or so and then I will start. Perfect, thank you. I'll take it. So I'll, I'll check it out. As soon as it's finished, I'll check this quickly and then we'll sit down. And then end here. Yeah. 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 All right, okay. it's, it's uh, one o'clock uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me. I did uh, this uh, similar lecture uh, last year as well. And the uh, topic is infections in immunocompromised patients uh, uh, in the, uh, predominantly in the, uh, in the pulmonary side of the story. But mostly, most of the lecture is, it's actually uh, immunocompromised patients, but most of the lecture uh, cases uh, are related to pulmonary infection. So. Uh, we will run through this as we go along. Have no disclosures. So uh, we will uh, review an approach to infections in immunocompromised patients and discuss infections associated with immunomodulated therapies and describe the timelines of infection in a transplant patient relevant and particularly we'll focus a little bit more on the pulmonary side of the uh, uh, story uh, uh, here and it'll all be case-based. Uh, so, so when it comes to uh, 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 various types of infections, we want to understand the immunology uh, of what the immune deficit is. Uh, so that always helps us think about what infections may be and uh, also might guide us uh, in terms of empiric antibiotics or antimicrobial uh, uh, therapy appropriately. So some of the defects, host defenses associated with infection could be, it could be damaged integument skin mucosa, neutropenia, so that is impaired innate immune system is neutropenia, or it could be impaired cellular immunity or impaired humoral immunity. So both the cellular and humoral immunity are considered the adaptive immune system, and, I, and it could be impaired splenic function. 
So let's start with the case and then we will develop the immune deficits as we go along and stuff like that. And this one is not a, a pulmonary case, but it's still very important uh, uh, because it can be, you can see that in ICU. So it's a 50 year old male with acute myelogenous leukemia uh, who develops fever six days after induction chemotherapy and notices pain around the Hickman catheter and the temperature uh, 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 around the, uh, and the temperature is about 101.8, uh, patient is tachycardic, uh, severe mucositis from the chemotherapy. And there is some erythema at the uh, exit site of the Hickman line. The rest of the exam is normal. The Y count is, uh, is obviously uh, uh, low from the uh, chemotherapy. So the best regimen, antibiotic regimen for him, uh, obviously uh, uh, the major immune deficit uh, uh, at this point is innate immune deficit and neutropenia. So we are looking at uh, translocation of bacteria with mucositis. And so we are looking predominantly at gram negative coverage, including pseudomonas. So cefepime sounds like a good answer. But there is also additional uh, erythema at the Hickman site. So we want to think about vancomycin as well. So the answer would be uh, uh, cefepime plus vancomycin will be probably the uh, right uh, uh, answer uh, uh, here. But if there is in neutropenic patients, particularly uh, who develop mucosal barrier injury uh, or, uh, along with cytopenia, uh, uh, meaning mucositis uh, along with cytopenia, generally you want to, uh, you don't need uh, vancomycin all the time. Uh, uh, if the patient is in shock, if the patient has prior staph aureus infection, uh, this one, the patient has pneumonia that is suspicious additionally for staph aureus, uh, or patient has a line that has suspicion for infection uh, around the line, only then vancomycin is uh, needed. Uh, otherwise, by giving empiric vancomycin only promotes more VRE development in these patients. So in fact, it's a class 1B contraindication based on febrile neutropenia guidelines. Uh, so the answer is cephine plus vancomycin. So, uh, so what are the pathogens associated with the defects? So the defects uh, uh, in this patient uh, uh, is uh, we will talk about uh, 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 the skin deficit is uh, one thing. So the common bacteria that's associated with skin is skin organisms, staph aureus, coagulated staph. Occasionally, you see gram-negative organisms that can be colonized on the skin, such as pseudomonas, E. coli, or other gram-negative bacteria. And uh, let's not forget candida, which can also be colonized as well. So, uh, uh, so those are the things that we'll be considering if it's a skin source of infection. What about mucosal barrier injury, mucositis? Mm, that is where we get transmigration of bacteria. And so predominantly, we are looking at gram-negative bacteria. But let's not forget, uh, there's a gram-positive viridan streptococci. So in to prevent febrile neutropenia, uh, we give uh, uh, inf or, uh, or in post neutropenia uh, in AML high risk neutropenic patients, such as AML or allergenic bone marrow transplant, we do give neutropenic prophylaxis uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, gram positive, uh, with uh, uh, gram negative uh, antibacterial coverage. So, ciprofloxacin, for example. But we know ciprofloxacin does not have any, any uh, significant gram positive activity, particularly uh, uh, activity against viridine streptococci. So we start to see a lot of breakthrough with gram positive uh, organism, uh, oral organisms such as viridine streptococci. So now we are actually doing a study with the BMT team looking at Cipro versus Levo, because Levo has both the gram negative coverage and gram positive. And it seems like Levo may be the way to go in this uh, neutropenic uh, prophylaxis. Mm, uh, uh, obviously, because there is mucosal barrier injury, uh, 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 there is candida which lies in the mucosa uh, comes, uh, becomes a problem. And, and so we do fluconazole prophylaxis, but in high risk neutropenic patients, uh, uh, we tend to give we substitute fluconazole to additional mold prophylaxis uh, 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 particularly in the AML and allergenic transplant where we give posoconazole or a substitute voriconazole for that reason. But predominantly, our interest is candida uh, at this point of time. And then the other one that is a mucosal pathogen is uh, HSV that can reactivate. So we give a cyclivir a prophylaxis, 400 milligram twice a day. The candida prophylaxis is typically anywhere between 100 to 400 milligrams daily, but 100 is plenty. Uh, and we give it, how long do you give the prophylaxis, uh, whether it's bacteria, fungi, or virus, until mm, the neutropenia resolves. So beyond that, that is not needed. We may extend uh, the uh, antifungal uh, viral prophylaxis depending on further immune deficit on the patient. Uh, and based on that, we may extend to cover other things which we'll talk about down the road. So uh, case two is a 22-year-old woman with aplastic anemia who received allergenic stem cell transplant nine days ago. 
and the patient develops fever and in the skin develops a tender skin uh, uh, lesion uh, uh, and it's very tender and Y count is very low. It's only a uh, 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 hundred like uh, Y count. So the patient is severely neutropenic. Mm, and what test will uh, uh, give you the answer? Mm, uh, and so when you see a condition like this, along with uh, uh, central necrosis, like, like that in a patient who's acutely neutropenic, mm, uh, uh, like such as an allergenic central transplant, we cannot forget a condition called ectaema gangrenosum. Mm, so ideally, uh, uh, blood cultures, yes, if the blood cultures may be positive, mm, uh, but we want skin biopsy uh, uh, additionally as well uh, to get the organisms in the uh, skin biopsy. So what are all the organisms that can potentially cause ectema gangrenosum? So the failure here is neutropenia, once again, innate immune deficit. So, um, uh, so, any, uh, so what are the risks for it is uh, conditions such as leukemia where we get chemotherapy, conditions like hematopoid stem cell transplants where uh, they give conditioning regimens. So this happens during the neutropenic phase. Yes, uh, classically it's associated with pseudomonas, but any bacteria can be associated mm, uh, with this, including Staph aureus, Quagnacus, Staph or gram positive streptococci. You have seen patients with E. coli developing ectoema. Fungi such as Candida or Aspergillus or some other molds can cause ectoema as well. And, and rarely herpes, uh, 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 herpes virus is not associated with uh, uh, I shared with ectema. Uh, the reason why it was placed here is because what sort of prophylaxis is there. So ectema is caused uh, predominantly by gram-negative bacilli like, like pseudomonas, uh, gram-positive organisms, or fungi. Those are the things that tends to cause ectema. And the failure is severe neutropenia. So, high, uh, so, uh, so in, in severe neutropenic patients, we tend to prophylax appropriately like what I said for a ciprofloxacin, but maybe down the road, we may be switching to levofloxacin in our center based on uh, our study results, which is moving uh, to cover the gram positive viridine ciprofloxacin, fluconazole and acyclovir. All right, next. So a 30, 38 year old man with ulcerative colitis uh, uh, is on therapy with infliximab and prednisone. So infliximab is TNF alpha inhibitor uh, and the prednisone is being tapered. He's admitted with a two week history of progressive dry cough, fever, and dyspnea, and uh, uh, PPD was negative. Uh, patient has obviously fever, uh, uh, oxygen saturation, 94% on room air, bilateral RALS, WBC count was uh, 5,200, septrioxone erythromycin was empirically started. Over the two days, hypoxia rapidly uh, uh, worsens. So the concern here is, what is, uh, uh, what is going on? So obviously, would you switch to vancomycin and imipenem for uh, like a HAP uh, condition? Or would you do a high resolution CT to understand the process a little bit better? Would you actually go out and get a BRAM uh, with BAL looking for a specific pathogen? Or would you uh, 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 start empiric anti-TB therapy at this point of time? So let's uh, dwell into this case a little bit further. So the answer here is uh, bronch and BL because the condition, as you can see on the uh, X-ray, uh, uh, has uh, diffuse, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, 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 interstitial infiltrates. So this condition is actually PCP. So what is the immune deficit here uh, uh, in, the, in this condition? So obviously PCP is a steroid loving disease. Predominantly it's a T cell, a T cell disorder. So infliximab uh, is not necessarily a T cell uh, 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 affecting disorder, but infliximab uh, is uh, uh, infliximab affects TNF alpha, and TNF alpha is an interface cytokine. It interacts between the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system, and that's why it's called an interface cytokine, and that's why it's blocked. So there is, uh, 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 the, so it sort of sort of affects the uh, uh, T cell pathways a little bit. But when you add steroids to it, mm, and that adds to the uh, uh, T cell immune deficit that tends to uh, uh, cause uh, additional trouble. So we, we, we have to worry about what are the conditions that are associated with uh, TNF alpha related uh, 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 pathogens. So when you look at T cell related dysfunction, uh, steroid therapy is more common, TNF alpha less common, HIV obviously organ, solid organ transplants predominantly, they carry a lot of T cell dysfunction. In the bone marrow transplant, in the T cell dysfunction that develops soon after bone marrow transplant can last up to a year, yeah, uh, even though you're not giving any treatment that affects uh, T cell dysfunction. In the solid organ transplant, they are always T cell suppressed because the predominant medication uh, uh, that we are giving, tacrolimus, serolimus, calcineurin blockers, or uh, uh, um, uh, 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 the uh, purine analogs 
or uh, cell set, mycophenolate, that kind of medications, all of these uh, uh, or cell cycle blockers, such as Evrolimus, Sirolimus, uh, any of these medications, uh, uh, predominantly they act in T cell pathway because we are only, uh, only interested in T cell based chronic rejection in solid organs. That's what you're trying to prevent. So uh, the organisms uh, that tend to cause trouble are intracellular pathogens. And intracellular pathogens classically are fungi, such as pneumocystis. And so we do bacterium prophylaxis or cryptococcus or aspergillus or candida. We traditionally don't go for uh, these prophylaxis depending on how risky the patients are. Those are the people who end up getting aspergillus. For example, in lung transplants, we do uh, tend to get inhaled, uh, inhaled ambisome because there's a risk for anastomotic and uh, 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 post-transplant aspergillosis. So inhaled ambisome tends to protect that pretty well. So we tend to give prophylaxis, but we don't do that routinely in all transplants. What about uh, bacteria, intracellular bacteria, such as uh, 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 TB, mycobacteria, nocardia, legionella. So generally, when you give bacterium prophylaxis, that tends to cover against nocardia and legionella as well. Mm, uh, and mostly viruses, uh, such as uh, uh, herpes simplex, varicella zoster, cytomegaloviruses, and other viruses like EBV, adeno, that can also uh, uh, get reactivated and cause trouble, or adeno, you can acquire and get into trouble. So we do have uh, uh, prophylaxis for CMV, we tend to give, we do have prophylaxis for uh, HSV or VZV, which is acyclovir or acyclovir. we tend to give. And uh, the other condition, other uh, problem in the in parasite is uh, toxoplasma. Obviously, the bacterium prophylaxis can cover that as well. So consider prophylaxis for PCP uh, uh, with bacterium in patients on chronic steroid therapy. Uh, if your steroid dose is approximately 20 milligrams or more for 20 days, you can remember approximately 20 for 20 days uh, is sort of the answer uh, 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 that you can remember. Uh, and the immune deficit is T cell deficit. All right, next case, a 64 uh, uh, year old uh, uh, man with multiple myeloma has two previous hospitalizations for sepsis. He's admitted with one day history of fevers and chills. He appears toxic and uh, the temperature is 102.6 Blood pressure uh, is uh, 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 90 over 60, heart rate is 110, respiratory rate is 22, mild pallor, no other abnormalities are noted on uh, examination. And so the blood culture obtained oh, very likely will grow what are the organisms. So we have staph, uh, staph pneumonia, staph aureus, pseudomonas, and candida. Obviously, any of them it's possible, but based on the story here, in multiple myeloma, the predominant deficit is dysfunctional immunoglobulin. So it's an, a failure of B cell or humoral adaptive immune system. That is the failure. And gen, when, there, when that happens, you're looking at encapsulated organisms as the biggest problem. And these are bacterial organisms. So they are extracellular pathogens and encapsulated organisms such as strep pneumon. So that's what you would expect it to find uh, in this population. So, so when, it, when you have impaired humoral immunity in the adaptive side, uh, uh, such as uh, B cell dysfunction, uh, uh, such as in patients with uh, CLL or gamma globulin disorders, multiple myeloma, encapsulated organism is something you want to worry about, strep pneumo, hemophilus, Neisseria. And this is important. Like in patients with GVHD after lung transplant, after uh, bone marrow transplant, uh, when, they, when we use high dose steroids, meaning uh, a steroid dose of 0.5 milligram per kilogram equivalent of prednisone dose uh, 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 that we use. Uh, 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 and we're starting to use as uh, chronic GBSD treatment, and then it'll take a long time for the steroid to go down below that dosing. Mm, so when we do that, we automatically add encapsulated bacteria prophylaxis with PEN-DK. Uh, so penicillin D potassium, we tend to do that mm, in that setting. Uh, this will be obviously post-transplant when they develop uh, GBHD, when they are on, uh, on high-dose steroids, in addition to their standard GBHD prophylaxis with Dacro or something like that. When you have compromised splenic function, such as sickle cell disease, asplenia, or in people, so occasionally in people with a, 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 stematopoid, a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, you may also want to consider uh, uh, this as risk factors uh, for developing encapsulated organisms. So high-risk patients, ideally, the answer would be to immunize them before you get that immune deficit, before transplant. If you can immunize them for pneumonia, streptococcal, pneumococcal infections, or hemophilus influenza, that'll be more ideal. So, uh, so why understand the underlying immune deficit, uh, and why is this important? Is because uh, generally, compared to uh, uh, immunocompetent patients, in immunocompromised uh, uh, patients, the signs and symptoms of infections are often muted 
and differential diagnosis becomes much more broader uh, uh, and diagnostic testings are not readily available. Uh, and there is a rapid progression of infection. They tend to get pretty much uh, sicker very quickly. So, uh, so when we under, understand immune deficit, we can cut down some of these things and by uh, knowing which direction you want to go uh, in terms of initial antimicrobial therapy, uh, uh, what tests you want to order instead of ordering 1,000 tests, uh, uh, and also understanding what prophylaxis should be done so you can prevent these infections from happening in the first place. So when it comes to infections with immunomodulated therapies, such as TNF-alpha therapies and other immunomodulated therapies, let's, uh, where there are various different TNF-alpha in inhibitors, and obviously that's used in a variety of conditions of autoimmune diseases, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, in the GI system, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, uh, in the dermatology teams, like, uh, such as uh, psoriasis, mm, uh, in, obviously in rheumatology for various different conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. So there are various different conditions we tend to use uh, TNF-alpha uh, blockers. And uh, not every TNF-alpha blocker is similar. Mm, uh, 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 we have uh, things such as Atanasep, Infliximab, mm, Humira or Adalimumab, or uh, Synpony or uh, uh, Golimumab. Uh, so each one has slightly different structure. Mm, uh, so when you look at risk factors as to which is more potent when it comes to uh, immune deficit uh, uh, and cause trouble, Infliximab seems to be the worst mm, when it comes to uh, the uh, problems uh, uh, that you develop related to TNF-alpha uh, related uh, problems. Then comes Humira or Symphony and last is Embrel. Embrel has some of the least infectious risk compared to uh, uh, these agents. So what exactly happens? What is the problem? Uh, uh, is, so when, when there is innate immune system that engulfs uh, a bacteria, so what the predominant infections that we see are granulomatous infections. So when, whenever you have TNF-alpha uh, use, uh, and blockers use, uh, the infections that we are looking for is granulomatous infections, such as mycobacterial infection or inv uh, invasive mold infection, histoplasma, that kind of stuff. That's what we are looking at. So what is the immune deficit? What is happening is when there is innate immune system that engulfs these pathogens, uh, what happens is the macrophages, uh, which engulf as part of innate immune system, they engulf the back, uh, they, they form what is called as the phagosome inside. And from phagosome, uh, uh, they try to attach it to the next phase, which is lysosome. So then it becomes a phagolysosome. But the, uh, what happens, these particularly like TB, for example, the uh, AFB is very conniving. It does not allow uh, the, uh, 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 the phagolysosome uh, things happening. That's one way. There are many other ways, but that's definitely one way. So what happens is the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, activated macrophage is able to control it, but not able to kill it off. So yeah, it, it says, hey, you know what? I caught this thief and I'm not, I'm not able to do further with it. So I better need some help. So let me call some help. So the help cytokine release is, uh, is TNF-alpha. So, uh, uh, so it's a danger cytokine. So when TNF-alpha is released, uh, it, uh, it brings in uh, other uh, uh, lympho uh, 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 mononuclear cells, such as uh, lymphocytes, into it. So then it forms a wall around and forms what is called as granuloma. So when you, uh, when you block the granuloma formation in the, uh, uh, with the TNF-alpha blocker, obviously you'll get disseminated TB and other, other granulomatous infections. So that is the purpose of TNF-alpha. So that's what you want to remember. So the bacterial infections uh, 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 that are, you're concerned about are things such as you know, mycobacterium tuberculosis, listeria, legionella, nocardia. In fungus, you, you can get PCP, uh, histoplasma, poxy, crypto, aspergillus, so you want to be uh, uh, thinking about it. So uh, in, in prior studies, when they looked at, uh, uh, Wallace is a very uh, 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 experienced guy uh, who uh, reported a lot of uh, TNF alpha related infection, you can see that uh, 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 TB risk is very high. Uh, uh, when you compare infliximab to etanacept, uh, any all the infections are much more higher with infliximab compared to uh, 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 compared to etanacept. Mm, uh, so you can see that mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, uh, numbers are higher, histoplasma is higher. So with uh, nocardia uh, uh, and stuff like that. So uh, that's something to remember. And how when do, when when how soon after infliximab use do you see these uh, disease processes? In case you are getting exposed to these diseases. Generally, or, for, or you already have them, like if, you're, if you have latent TB, uh, when do you get reactivated? It typically has, seems to happen within the first uh, 90 days of uh, infection. So the highest risk factors seem to be within the first uh, 90 days, uh, particularly uh, more high with infliximab compared to etanacept. Mm, so that's what we want to remember. So what do you do to mitigate? Uh, 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 how do you prevent? 
uh, particularly TB, what do you do? And so let's, uh, we'll talk about it uh, uh, in, in, in the next coming cases. So a 43 year old uh, uh, woman with ulcerative colitis, she failed standard therapy starting on infliximab uh, with significant improvement of her abdominal symptom. Two months later, now she developed abdominal pain, low grade fever, weight loss, and the CT scan uh, uh, showed thickening, narrowing of ileum with enlarged mesenteric lymph nodes. So this condition could be, is it worsening ulcerative colitis? But patient is clinically improving, so less likely. Now, could this be disseminated histo? Possible. Uh, uh, ovarian cancer doesn't look like it uh, here. TB seems to be the number one condition that we are interested in uh, uh, here. So, uh, so it's extra pulmonary tuberculosis is what uh, we are interested in. So, so let's talk about tuberculosis infections in patients on TNF-alpha inhibitors. So uh, the risk, as I said, is the highest with infliximab compared to etanercept. And the risk is highest within the uh, first 90 days of infection. And, uh, and generally in this population, when you use TNF-alpha inhibitors, you tend to get more extra pulmonary TB and disseminated uh, tuberculosis. So general recommendation is you screen all patients for TB before starting TNF-alpha therapy. So it's a black box warning label. And uh, so every TNF-alpha uh, uh, patient will have to get screening for TB before they initiate uh, TNF-alpha inhibitors. Okay. And uh, in addition, you get a good history and you want to make sure there's no exposures mm, uh, 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 exam. And we tend to do the uh, IGRA assay or TB quantifran assay now. Uh, and if the TST uh, 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 skin test is greater than five millimeters or if the IGRA is positive, we do a uh, start therapy uh, treatment for latent tuberculosis. And uh, there are various, various different combinations we use. We, don't, we won't have to go into that, but let's assume we are treating them at INH for nine months. Mm, and when can we release these patients back to getting the TNF-alpha uh, uh, inhibitor. Mm, uh, so, so generally, uh, uh, it is about a month or so. So as long as you've had the latent infection, latent TB treated for, a, uh, for about four weeks or more, then you can continue the latent TB therapy uh, uh, and then reinitiate in, uh, uh, the TNF-alpha blockers. Mm, uh, uh, and it's very important to educate patients on symptoms of TB recurrence on patients uh, uh, who, uh, who are on infliximab uh, or any other TNF-alpha uh, uh, blockers. So this is a 52-year-old uh, uh, male with severe rheumatoid arthritis on prior therapy with steroids uh, and was recently started on infliximab about three months ago. And the PPD was negative. Patient develops progressive cough uh, with uh, a sputum, uh, productive sputum, low-grade fevers, and right-sided pleuritic uh, chest pain. And if you look at the uh, uh, x-ray clearly, uh, uh, there is an infiltrate, uh, uh, probably maybe there's a, maybe a small cavity, but uh, uh, on the uh, uh, right lung. And, uh, and if you look at uh, the sputum specimen, you're looking at beaded uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, bacteria, uh, which is a gram positive bacteria, which is uh, the beaded uh, bacteria. Uh, uh, so the condition is, uh, what is the condition uh, here? Could this be tuberculosis? Less likely when you see this kind of beater, but it's quite rarely possible. Uh, 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 there are certain, uh, this one, but this is too long to worry about tuberculosis when you just look at the grand stain alone. Aspergillus does not, uh, 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 this is not a fungus. Nocardia seems very likely here. Actino is a differential diagnosis, but for actino, you should have uh, other things like an uh, injury or, uh, or uh, it's unusual to get uh, a pulmonary actino directly. Uh, this one, uh, 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 this one. So mostly, uh, this is nocardia, where and then uh, obviously the mode of infection is you inhaled it. Mm. So uh, uh, what about other bacterial infections? Like uh, 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 the uh, with TNF alpha. So as we said, intracellular pathogens such as Legionella, Listeria, Nocardia have been assured. Mm. And so these are all. Uh, 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 so there is a FDA warning. Uh, on it. So uh, there are many, many cases that have been reported now. So we always look out for these infections. Mm, uh, 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 in, at least we keep them in our differential diagnosis when people come in with, uh, let's say, lung infiltrate post TNF alpha. Obviously, TB takes the cake. TB is number one, followed by other infections. So you want to suspect Legionella, Listeria, and Ocardia infections in patients with TNF alpha in, uh, uh, inhibitors in the right clinical context, and you want to perform appropriate tests not to miss them. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Legionella, yeah, I, I want you to uh, uh, remember, yeah, uh, and, yeah, there's a lot of Legionella outbreaks, particularly after a lot of flooding uh, 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 in the uh, Metro Detroit uh, region. Mm, uh, and it's uh, typically uh, uh, water-based uh, and air, uh, uh, like uh, uh, air conditioning uh, things. 
or sometimes like, people say the weather is good, I'm going to sit around in a fountain and the fountain water is not treated, it's not chlorinated and stuff like that. They inhale it and we have actually had patients coming just sitting on a fountain and develop Legionella or they went to a car wash and for some odd reason left there or they were doing their own car wash and they didn't wear any mask and these are immunocompromised patients, uh, including transplant patients. Uh, we actually had a patient who was doing his car wash. I think, I, I believe it's a kidney transplant patient uh, 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 at his home. And then a few days later, he came back with severe Legionella pneumonia. So, so uh, please remember Legionella, uh, and it's a simple test. It's a urine Legionella antigen. So uh, a 63-year-old woman uh, from Indianapolis uh, with rheumatoid arthritis has been started on therapy uh, uh, with uh, steroids followed by uh, Humira. Uh, uh, and uh, four months into her therapy, she developed malaise, fever, sputum, and blood cultures are negative. And uh, 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 if you look at the uh, uh, CT scan, there is uh, 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 infiltrates. And in the uh, uh, fungal staining, you're obviously see, uh, 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 seeing pathogens. Mm, uh, and if you go a little bit deeper, you can find that there are small spikes uh, uh, that are passive. And this is histoplasma. Mm. Uh, so, uh, uh, so as we said, in TNF-alpha inhibitors, they carry higher risk for pneumocystis and granulomatous infections, such as histoplasma, coccidioidomycosis, crypto, or aspergillus. Mm, uh, obviously, we don't necessarily prophylax them uh, because the cases are, the risk is there, but relatively speaking, the, uh, 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 so we take it on a case, we rather treat them. Uh, you know, the number needed to treat is fairly high, so we don't necessarily prophylax them. But if there's a strong risk factor, we may consider that on a case-by-case -case basis. So routine prophylaxis is not recommended. We just want you to be careful and suspect it. Mm, uh, suspect is to plasma, coxy, crypto uh, in patients who have good epidemiologic risk factors. Um, uh, uh, and perform appropriate testing, including uh, BAL. And, uh, and clearly, things that we do want to prophylax for is uh, PCP uh, uh, routine. Uh, and then, uh, uh, what about other infections with TNF alphas? Uh, you can get uh, uh, other bacterial infections, less common, uh, uh, but predominantly it's TB or latent TB. What about other viruses? Like a hep B or a hep C reactivation uh, can happen. Uh, so, in these populations uh, who have acute hep B or uh, hep C, uh, or chronic hep or hep with severe liver disease uh, 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 or active varicella infection, you want to delay the uh, uh, TNF alpha or avoid it. Mm, uh, uh, and obviously, in systemic fungal infection, once your treatment has been initiated for systemic fungal infection and the patient seems to be stable a month or two, then you can reinitiate TNF alpha uh, inhibitor in these conditions. Mm, uh, okay, now a 36 year old woman with multiple sclerosis is on therapy with natalizumab or tizabri. It's an integrin uh, receptor uh, uh, antagonist. Integrins are necessary for uh, 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 neutrophil migration uh, into the tissue. So uh, uh, when, uh, when for whatever reason, uh, we need neutrophils to go into the tissue, they go and attach to integrins uh, and integrins help secure them. And then they go between space, vascular endothelium spaces and they go into there. So, uh, uh, so uh, that is, that's why how the uh, integrin receptor antagonists work. So two years after therapy uh, 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 was initiated, she noted progressive difficulty in concentration, weakness of left lower extremity, loss of balance and was admitted to the hospital. Lumbar puncture is done and that uh, test, uh, 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 the test you should order on CSF that will likely provide that diagnosis. So obviously you can see periventricular uh, 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 changes uh, on the MRI. Mm, uh, 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 the uh, herpes simplex PCR, uh, 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 herpes simplex is not a chronic disease. Herpes is a very aggressive meningitis mm, and stuff like that. So it's an acute disease. So is varicella zoster mm, and stuff like that. What about uh, West Nile? West Nile can mimic a lot of things and stuff like that, but there's no epidemiological history. Mm, and West, this is not a, a classic presentation of West Nile on the MRI. Mm, uh, what about crypto? Crypto is more of a, a, a space occupying lesion uh, on the MRI. So the virus here uh, is PML caused by JC uh, uh, virus. So the risk factors, what about uh, uh, PML risk factor uh, uh, is very high in patients receiving uh, natalizumab uh, who are JC, pass, JC virus zero positive. So there are, uh, uh, at least in this paper in 2012, 212 uh, confirmed patients with progressive multifocal uh, look and cephalopathy, PML, out of the uh, 100,000 patients treated. So overall incidence was 2.11 per thousand patients. And the PML risk factor can be stratified by three risk factors. Uh, how long is your treatment? If your treatment is longer, greater than two years, then you carry a higher risk. Mm, uh, 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 prior immune suppressive uh, use, 
and if you are zero positive for JC virus. And once again, JC virus zero positivity is fairly common among uh, uh, among general population. Mm, so if your female risk is uh, uh, is if you have all three risk factors, you have a one in hundred chance of developing PML. So you better avoid uh, uh, treating uh, with uh, this kind of therapy because we don't truly have treatment for PMLs. Mm, uh, and if uh, if you are zero negative then your risk is much lower, it's one in 10,000. So you just want to understand risk before offering therapies in this uh, population. So, uh, 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 so in summary, we're going to uh, screen and treat patients uh, for latent tubercul uh, uh, LTBI before uh, uh, initiating TNF-alpha inhibitor therapy. This, is, uh, this summary is only for TNF-alpha therapy. Consider opportunistic bacterial fungal infections in the differential diagnosis of in infections in patients with TNF-alpha inhibitors. And obviously, JC virus associated PML can occur in patients on natalizumab uh, therapy. So now moving on to timeline of infections in transplant, uh, obviously solid organs and hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So a 58-year-old male who received a diseased donor kidney transplant eight months ago, he was admitted with two-week history of headaches and altered mentation. CSF showed significantly elevated protein. Glucose was low normal and Y count was elevated to 214 with predominant lymphocytes. And what is the most likely uh, uh, cause of this uh, uh, meningitis? Mm, uh, so uh, obviously, step pneumo is a much more aggressive meningitis and predominantly you will see, at least, uh, you will see neutrophilic predominant uh, uh, process and, uh, and the glucose will be very low. Uh, 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 what about uh, uh, listeria? Similarly, it's an acute meningitis. Mm, uh, MTB can mimic a lot of things uh, and stuff like that, but this is uh, you don't want to miss cryptococcus in this uh, setting. So uh, if you look at <coughs> general timeline of infections in the absence of uh, prophylaxis, in the absence of standard prophylaxis, uh, generally uh, this one. So we can divide uh, uh, solid organ, uh, this is uh, uh, solid organ transplantation into one month, six months and beyond. So the rationale for, uh, and if you look at solid organs, as I said, the predominant uh, 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 treatment of, uh, to prevent rejection that we give are targeting uh, T cells. So we are only interested in intracellular uh, pathogens in the long term, uh, uh, meaning viruses, fungus, that kind of stuff. Uh, and less, uh, so we are, and generally the prophylaxis is directed towards those uh, 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 side of uh, pathogens. Uh, so in the first month of uh, solid organ transplant, uh, you can predominantly get just like any patient uh, who undergoes a surgery, you're looking at surgical infections, such as wound infections, UTI, device infections, pneumonia, mm, uh, 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 or, or C. diff infections, that kind of stuff. So that's the bacterial stuff that you're looking at in blue. Mm, uh, occasionally, you can get a hepatitis uh, 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 HSV uh, reactivation or uh, uh, occasionally you can get reactivation of hepatitis B or C viruses in the viral side. Uh, and uh, what you don't want to miss is donor-derived infection. So within the first, mm, uh, say, uh, six, six weeks to about three months of transplant, if you have something unusual uh, 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 that you're worried about, the first question we ask is, could this be donor? So we get the donor data, donor things, and we start uh, whatever safe sample we look and test for in the donor. Mm, but if you look at it, there is no other opportunistic infection that we are interested in in the first month of solid organ transplant. Yes, rarely uh, 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 intercellular patches can happen the first month, but practically we are only interested in surgical infections and hospital-acquired uh, hospital uh, 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 infections at this point of time. Then beyond a month or so is where the T cell deficit kicks in significantly. And that's where you're looking at uh, intercellular pathogens. So what about viruses? You look where it could be uh, HSV, VZV, uh, or CMV, EBV, uh, or uh, 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 C reactivation. Uh, and, uh, but when you look at other viruses, such as respiratory or enteric viruses, uh, uh, such as influenza, parainfluenza, hemophilus, mm, uh, I'm sorry, influenza, parainfluenza, influenza, adeno, uh, or, or, or RSV, that happens during the season uh, throughout the year. The, and uh, through, uh, I'm sorry, throughout the uh, transplant, it can happen any time, mm, and uh, irrespective of the immune status, except they linger longer in this population and they can cause much more severe infections. Mm, and so that's what you want to remember okay, there. What about, so the, the, the peak, uh, provided they don't develop rejection, the peak immune deficit seems to be 
up to six months or so. After that, they start cutting back on the tacrolimus and other immune suppression. So you'll get less and less T cell suppression. Mm, so that's the six month cutoff on an arbitrary, uh, arbitrary range. But let's say there's a developed rejection mm, in the interim, obviously we reset the clock uh, for these uh, patients. So what about bacteria, intracellular pathogens, such as nocardia, listeria, uh, T, uh, TB? Mm, what about fungus, pneumocystis, aspergillus, uh, uh, cryptococcus candida, early on in uh, transplants, such as uh, liver transplants, particularly when they cut the gut, when they do Ruan Y anastomosis or small bowel transplant, we do give candida prophylaxis early on because it's a surgical problem. Mm, uh, but predominantly, uh, uh, beyond a month, we are more interested in mold-related infections. The other yeast we're interested is cryptococcus. Mm, uh, uh, so we look for cryptococcus uh, and stuff like that. Um, and if you live in an endemic region, such as, say, Arizona, where there is endemic for coxie, you may decide to give uh, fluconazole prophylaxis to prevent coxie in that. But traditionally, we look for these processes uh, early. We don't necessarily give prophylaxis for these molds routinely, except aspergillus. Depending on the risk of transplant, such as small bowel, where the risk is very high, we tend to give uh, uh, mold prophylaxis. And obviously, in lung transplant, we give inhaled and so on. What about parasitic uh, uh, infections? Uh, we are looking at toxoplasma, once again, intracellular pathogen. Uh, uh, and depending on where you live, uh, uh, Leishmania, Strongy, Trypanosoma, the kind of stuff that you want to remember. And then beyond about six months, the T cell deficit is so little, uh, if all goes well, uh, the transplant goes pretty well, and then uh, they cut down immune suppression to a bare minimum. Uh, and uh, uh, then the patient becomes more like a regular patient, uh, uh, like an immunocompetent patient. So, so we are only interested in uh, respiratory viral infections or conventional uh, uh, infections. But let's not forget a few infections. Mm, uh, uh, rarely, we see late onset CMV reactivation in these patients. Uh, we do see rarely PTLD, which is EBV directed uh, against B cells. So we develop post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders and stuff like that. Or rarely we get papillomaviruses related infections. But um, the thing that you don't want to kind of miss out in a few patients, uh, uh, particularly the, in the prolonged uh, uh, transplant, remote transplant, but they still have some degree of T cell deficit, are organisms such as Cryptococcus, Listeria, Legionella. You never forget them. The, uh, they can develop any time in their transplants. Okay, and stuff like that. And depending on if you're an endemic fungi, depending on your risk factors, you could develop that too. But Tryptococcus, Listeria legionella in remote transplants uh, in solid organ site can happen, so you don't want to miss that. So generally, we prophylax uh, for things that we can prophylax, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, CMV, we have valgancyclovir and uh, uh, PCP uh, uh, in UTI and kidney transplant. And then uh, uh, if your CMV, the valgancyclovir does cover for HSV and DZV, so we don't use that. But if your CMV negative, negative, donor recipient negative, negative, then we tend to give uh, a DZV prophylaxis, which covers for HSV as well, uh, using valacyclovir. Uh, or acyclovir. And generally, we tend to give it for up to, uh, depends on, depending on the transplant and immune risk factor, anywhere between three months to up to a year. So it depends on the particular transplant. Lung transplants go a little longer. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, this is a bone marrow story. A 54-year-old woman uh, received an allergenic hematopoietic stem cell at transplant four months ago. She's on high-dose uh, steroids for treatment of acute graft versus host disease. The patient is admitted mm, with uh, low-grade fever, cough, and a left pleuritic chest pain. The key element is pleuritic chest pain. And clearly, you can see uh, 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 it's almost like a CAT scan, even though it's a chest X-ray. You can see mm, uh, 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 a lung infiltrate, um, which is a, a nodular infiltrate, and, and which almost has a halo-like sign. Obviously, it'll be much more visible on a CAT scan, uh, so you don't want to miss out. Uh, uh, aspergillus in this case. Obviously, you can develop lung abscess, but it doesn't look like it. And nocardia can uh, mimic uh, that as well. Tuberculosis can mimic. But in this case, we are more, more common stuff is aspergillus. So uh, what, what about the timeline when it comes to hematopoietic uh, stem cell uh, transplant in the absence of any uh, prophylaxis? So what's going on? Mm, uh, so here, mm, uh, we divide uh, 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 this into engraftment, which can take up to uh, uh, a month or so anywhere between two weeks to up to a month. So up to engraftment is one phase. From engraftment to up to 100 days is another phase. And, and then beyond 100 days is another phase. So what are all the immune deficit that's happening uh, during uh, uh, the uh, phase one, which is before uh, pre-engraftment? From the time you initiated uh, uh, conditioning regimen or chemotherapy, to wipe out the uh, marrow uh, uh, till you develop 
neutrophils, uh, acute, uh, I mean, absolute neutrophil count developing 500 or higher for two days in a row. That is definition for engraftment. So during that period, the immune deficit is predominantly neutropenia or innate immune deficit. And there's a lot of mucocutaneous def uh, uh, deficits because you can develop a lot of mucositis. Mm, so, so during that time, we, uh, we can develop, as we earlier said, gram-negative bacilli, viridine streptococci, staphylococcus epidermidis from lines mm, uh, or candida uh, from the gut. Uh, uh, aspergillus, aspergillus is particularly special. Mm, aspergillus has two types of immune system that needs to control it. So neutropenia is one immune, uh, so neutrophils is one immune system uh, uh, that is important for aspergillus control. The other immune system is uh, T cells. Mm, so, uh, so aspergillus can develop during the neutropenic phase or it can develop during the T cell defici deficient phase. Mm, and then obviously uh, from viruses, we talked about herpes simplex viruses that can uh, get reactivated. Uh, 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 at this uh, 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 point of time. So we tend to give prophylaxis for herpes simplex candida. Uh, and in high-risk transplants, we convert the uh, uh, yeast prophylaxis to a more mold to cover yeast and mold using voriconazole or pozoconazole. Mm, and obviously, respiratory and enteric virus can happen anytime uh, 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 throughout the uh, transplant time point. Mm, uh, and generally, it's seasonal. Mm, and then once you engraft, you're not interested in uh, bacterial anymore because neutrophils are intact after that. So you're not going to give bacterial prophylaxis. More, more now you're interested in some degree of B cell deficit that takes up to three months to recover, mm, three to six months, but predominantly three months. And then T cell deficit is a major thing. So, so you can develop pneumococcus infection uh, and hemophilus infection because of the B cell. And uh, so we tend to give prophylaxis mm, with pen -BK. In people, in addition, we give steroids that tends to add to the beta deficit for GVHD. Mm, uh, those are the people who end up getting pen -BK prophylaxis after engraftment. Mm, uh, and what about uh, uh, fungal infections? Uh, we get aspergillus infections, uh, uh, mold infections, or PCP infections. So we tend to prophylax for them during this uh, phase. What about uh, 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 viral infections? We prophylax for cytomegalovirus, or uh, we cannot. There's no treatment for uh, uh, PTLD uh, or EBV-related uh, infections. We monitor for it. So in cytomegalovirus infections, in the past, uh, uh, we only monitored them because the treatment, namely gancyclovir or valgancyclovir that we use for prophylaxis, particularly val valcite or valgancyclovir, is already myelotoxic. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, uh, it, uh, you tend to uh, destroy the graft, uh, which is the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. So we do preemptive management. Nowadays, in very high-risk uh, uh, bone marrow transplants, uh, such as people who have received thymoglobulin uh, or people who have developed haplotransplants or, 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 and that kind of patients, we do have a new medication called Latormovir that we use for prophylaxis up to 100 days. Mm, from engraftment up to 100 days, we uh, use that. So that is definitely uh, uh, available. And uh, Latormovir does not have anti-HSV activity mm, or VZV activity. So we tend to give acyclovir prophylaxis along with Latormovir. And Latormovir advantage is it's not myelotoxic. Uh, it's pretty benign. Uh, otherwise, it's given for prophylaxis. So it's approved uh, for it. Uh, and then as we go further and further, unlike solid organ transplant, uh, if patients don't develop GVHD, they actually go off the immune suppression. Mm, uh, uh, but T cell deficit takes a very long period of time to recover, uh, from six months to up to two years in patients. Mm, so in those patients, you can potentially get T cell related problems such as PCP, aspergillus, uh, or uh, varicella, mm, uh, or uh, varicella zoster. Mm, uh, so we tend to give uh, prophylaxis for varicella zoster up to a year post allergenic bone marrow transplant for all those well. So those are some things that you want to remember. So that, that is the phase three, which is beyond 100 days. The predominant host deficit is some degree of B cell, predominantly T cell based okay, deficit that you want to remember. So that's the uh, uh, sort of the prophylaxis that we talked about. So in summary, the timeline of infections after transplantation happens due to specific defects in the immune system. The patterns may be impacted by the use of antimicrobial prophylaxis. And understanding this timeline helps direct the management of these infections. I believe that's my last slide. So uh, if people have to ask questions, either can, uh, I don't know if they can chat or, uh, or maybe Daniel, you can ask, the, if anybody has questions, they can ask and I'll answer through this. I'm gonna stop sharing. We don't have any questions from anybody here. Anybody questions? Yeah, I don't. thank you very much. I don't know if I'm gonna take a quick look in the chat box. I don't see anything there either. Oh. Thank right. you, that was very helpful. Thank you very much. Very good, thank, thanks very much for inviting me. I have one uh, question, Dr. Ramesh. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. 
uh, just role of serology for diagnosis of fungal pneumonia in high risk patients, but we're unable to perform bronchoscopy on it. Role of uh, uh, what, what, which one? Serology. Serology, whether. Oh, role of uh, serology. Okay, th that's a good question. Uh, so if you are suspecting for whatever reason, let's assume that uh, uh, patient has. Uh, uh, um, uh, major platelet issue with bleeding issues, and uh, uh, and it's a very high risk to do branch for some reason. But ideally, yes, like, uh, our branch teams have been very good. Our pulmonary branch teams have been very good, even in our uh, 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 in our uh, what do you call allergenic stem cell transplant with uh, uh, severe uh, cytopenias. And they, uh, when we ask for it, they get it done. So that's not, not an issue. But for whatever reason, you're not able to do a, a bronch. Uh, uh, certainly, we do uh, uh, biomarkers uh, or serologic uh, 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 biomarkers that we tend to use in this uh, setting. So what is available? Uh, what about uh, antibodies? Antibodies, are they useful uh, uh, when you have a lung infiltrate? Antibodies. So what antibodies are we looking at? Like, uh, uh, we have antibodies. Like, uh, for, you can do an, an, an aspergillus-based antibody uh, or, or endemic mold-related antibodies. That's called fungal antibodies, uh, such as histoplasma, coxy, that kind of stuff. But the headache there is uh, uh, the antibodies only uh, uh, tell us there may be potential exposure. Uh, uh, we don't know whether they are. So they're not very useful mm, at all. So we don't use serologic uh, testing uh, from the antibody standpoint. Uh, in terms of diagnosis, except in, uh, in a certain endemic mold like COXI, for example, where serology mm, uh, has some role to play uh, to make in, the, in terms of uh, diagnosis. What about uh, other uh, 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 testing? Antigens are very useful mm, uh, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, so we can actually identify cell wall uh, uh, antigens such as uh, Aspergillus galactomannan or, or fungitel. Fungitel is beta deglucan. Uh, so in, in fungi, uh, including molds that have uh, 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 that have these antigens, uh, then we can use the, there's some some cross activity of Aspergillus galactomannan uh, with uh, certain other molds, but that is pretty uh, uh, useful. So if there is a we use a cutoff of uh, 0 0.5 uh, uh, optical density uh, uh, and above in the right clinical setting, uh, uh, and the problem is uh, the uh, uh, all these uh, zero biomarkers are more validated in the stem cell population uh, and have not been validated in, in the solid population or other immunodeficit patients. So we got to take that with a pinch of salt. Mm, so, uh, uh, so when we did, we just looked at uh, our BALs mm, that we did in the lung transplant population in the uh, lung transplant uh, uh, population. And when we looked at uh, uh, bronco, uh, or called BAL galactomannan and the utility of BAL galactomannan uh, 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 in this population to identify invasive pulmonary astrogelosis, it failed miserably uh, and really did not help us uh, 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 in directing at this point. It never uh, helped us in this population because it's not been validated and it seems to be overcalling. The serology seems to be uh, uh, overcalling. So yes, biomarkers uh, uh, are, uh, are getting there. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, what we are moving towards is more of PCR-based testing for moles, including aspergillus that are coming. But the problem there is how do you differentiate uh, colonization versus infection? So there's a lot of noise. And the same um, uh, test, like, uh, for example, PCP. Uh, since the advent of PCR uh, that we have started using in our center, the false positive rates are tremendous. So once again, we take things with a, uh, 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 with a pinch of salt. Mm, uh, so in PCP, if somebody is uh, incidentally had a bronch for whatever reason, and, and PCP, uh, a PCP was positive or a sputum, uh, uh, they did a PCP uh, um, uh, PCR and that was positive. Uh, we, and clinically, the story doesn't fit. You could use uh, beta -D -glu uh, glucan as an additional test. And the beta -D glucan, if it is negative, the negative predictive value is very high on the beta d -glucan. The positive predictive value of beta d is, uh, uh, is terrible. Mm, uh, uh, and so, uh, so we don't use beta d uh, uh, for that. We try to, for ruling out diseases uh, like a, a, a PCP, if once it's negative, then it's, we can say safely that it's just colonization and stuff like that. So, so those are, so, uh, so we take it with a pinch of salt, uh, but we obviously we do use them uh, uh, in the right clinical setting. Uh, 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 appropriate. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Thank All you right. again very much. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank, thanks very much for having me. Uh, have a good afternoon.